Welcome to another episode of IAAF Inside Athletics. I'm your host, Atto Bolden. We have a very special show today, and that's because we are in the presence of royalty, British royalty, the world record holder in the women's marathon, Paula Radcliffe is my guest. Paula, welcome to the show. Thank you. Let me start by talking about your early involvement in running. You come from a running family. Was there a deliberate push, Paula? You would be going to the field, you would be going to the track, you will run, or did it come naturally for you? No, it came from it came completely from me. Um, I can't really remember a time when I wasn't just running around. Uh, and my dad was running marathons right. as, as kind of just a, a fun running, mass running marathon runner. Um, and I used to join in with him on some of his long runs, take him a little drink and maybe join in for, I don't know, it was probably a half mile, thousand meters or so. Um, and I used to go and watch, and I can remember being at the side of the London Marathon, waiting for my dad with his little Mars bar to give him a wow. snack on the way, and seeing Ingrid Christensen run past, right. en route to setting the world record in 1985, and just thinking, wow, she's right up there with the lead man, and she looks so strong, I'd love to be able to run like that one day. So I pestered and pestered my dad, <laughs> and he went and researched the local athletics clubs, and took me down as soon as I was nine, and signed me up, and basically, I've been there ever since. That's got to be a really cool scene in your movie. <laughs> you being played by a young girl, watching Ingrid, and then you having the world record later. Um, let's talk a little bit about that record. Um, it's now 15 years that you've had it. When, when you look at the landscape, how much longer do you think it's going to last? I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's a really tough question because when you, you set the record, you just try and push yourself as hard as I could and I can remember in the in the last couple of miles when I knew I was inside the old record right. just trying to push myself as hard as I could so that it had a chance to, to stand for as long as possible and I genuinely thought when I finished I was going to be there I thought I could come back and I could beat the time right. and improve on it a little bit and that never happened and the thing about the marathon is you've got to be in that shape and there's got to be a race and it's got to be good conditions on a good course Perfect storm. things yeah. have got to come together for it and I feel like that can happen at any time it happened for me like right. that um, and so at the same time it I didn't do anything superhuman. It can get beaten at any time. I don't want it to. I would like it to last for a little bit longer. <laughs> An honest world record holder who admits, yes, it's cool to be the fastest ever in a bit. I talk to so many world and they say, oh, you know, if it falls, it falls, it's fine. I'm yeah, like, they're lying. no, that's, that's probably not the case. Your childhood though, you had asthma. There's so many things that you could look at in your childhood and say, the future of this child is probably not gonna be world record holder in the marathon. How did you overcome that to get to, to where you did? Which you um, I think I was really lucky. I was really lucky on a number of levels that I had a really supportive coach yeah. who kind of understood about the bigger picture, talked to lots of other people, other coaches, um, and got a lot of input um, and certainly helped me with the, uh, when I was diagnosed with the asthma, because what was happening, I was maybe 13, 14, and I yeah. was blacking out after training runs. And so I was actually really scared that the doctor was going to say, okay, you have something and you can't, you can't run anymore. Oh, wow. um, and he wasn't. I got a really, really good family doctor, just my family GP. And he said, no, 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 it's fine. You have asthma. You're going to have to take inhalers, but you're going to control it. And it's not going to stop you doing anything that you want to do. It's, you're just going to have to, to look after it in that way. So since then, I think we just kind of went with it and you, you learn certain things. And, Unfortunately, as you get older, you don't really learn too much because I, I know that um, if I go away to altitude when I've got a cold, nine times out of ten, yes. it's going to develop into bronchitis or something. And I still did it last week. So <laughs> you, you, you think you can push through things a lot, and I yeah. think that's part of the mentality uh, of what we do. But you I can't think be a marathon a, runner without pushing through pain, Exactly. Right? You have to learn also to, to recognize your body and to try and, try and work with those things. But I think it, it's all of those things coming together. I think it was an, an upbringing that I had. Um, with my, my family that basically said, if you want something, you go and work as hard as you can and you see whether you can get something. Uh, and if you don't do it the first time, you just keep trying and keep trying different ways. So I think that, that really helped too. You went to a lot of world championships, a lot of Olympic games, ran the five, ran the 10, and you were always just off the medals, almost there. But then you moved to the marathon and something, it, it, the marathon fit you. Yeah. What were you missing on the track that you got on the roads? Um, I think, well, definitely I was missing the finish on the track. I, I, I could stay with it. I had the endurance to, to stay with yeah. it, but then I was just getting blown out in the, in the last lap all of the time. And I, wasn't, I, I worked on it 
um, but I just wasn't competitive. I didn't have all of the cards in my hand, if you like, yes. that someone like Mo Farah would yes. have in terms of being able to finish like that on, on the last lap. But when I moved to the marathon, it's different. It's not about <laughs> sprint finishing the marathon. It's about who's the strongest at the end. So mm -hmm. I felt like I, I found my event where I was good at it and I was able, my body was good at it. My body for a long time was able to absorb the amounts of training that I needed to do so that I got to that start line knowing that I trained harder than anyone else and knowing I was going to make people hurt really badly in that race um, and I think that that suited me. It's something about the, there's like a mythical mental battle about the marathon as well as the yes, physical of side course. of it. It's not just against the rivals, it's about the road and the 26.2 miles as well and I think the magic of big city marathons as well is, is, is something that camaraderie of sharing the road with 55,000 other people <laughs> is something that you don't get yes. in, in many sports. Yeah. One of the things that I think is a big part of your legacy is your very strong stance. Not now, not recently, since I've known you. You've been a very staunch advocate against doping. Tell me about where your assessment of our sport would lie currently. I think, uh, I think there's two issues there. There's kind of the marketing of the sport and then there's the trust and the belief in the sport. They're definitely related. Um, but there are, there are also separate areas that need to be worked on. The youth of today, the youngsters have far too many choices open and we're not trying hard enough to say, hey, athletics is cool, come and try it. And making it fun, making it fun for the people watching and making it fun for the people competing. But the biggest issue, yeah, is that if you're a parent or if you're a young athlete, you want to come into a sport where you know you're going to be able to find out how good you are and yes. you're not going to be competing against people who are cheating and taking shortcuts and you're not going to be offered that choice either if you're a parent. We want our kids to, to go into something where their, their health is going to be the most important yes. thing and they're going to be able to go after their dreams and genuinely see if they're, if they're good enough. So I think all of that has to be restored um, and it, it's a lot of work and I think we've been through the worst of it. Yeah. I do believe we're coming out the other side of it now. Yeah. I think we need a lot more funding in the Athletics Integrity Unit um, and in anti-doping generally. We need the turnabout that is already happening with the athletes. I think if you think back to when we were competing, a lot of people were like, ah, drugs isn't that big of an issue in sport. Do we really need to stand up? Do we really need to ask the Federation to do this? Right. Whereas now there's a lot more of a, a groundswell of demand from the athletes saying to the Federation, saying to the Integrity Unit, hey, you need to protect us better. Your number one job is protecting the clean athletes and making sure we have that level playing field on. And that's the message we're overwhelmingly getting from these juniors here is it has to be fair. We have to be able to compete fairly with everyone else. Now, I know that you are part of this Athletics Integrity Unit. Give me the, a brief synopsis of what that unit does and what so its mission is. It's kind of groundbreaking. Um, it's revolutionary within sport uh, in that athletics has been pretty much the first sport to set up its own independent integrity unit that looks after all elements of integrity within athletics. So it's not just anti-doping, it's also corruption, which needed looking at. Yes. It's also the transfer of allegiance, illegal betting, age group manipulation. So pretty much anything that comes oh. under the umbrella of, of integrity yeah. and ethics it, it is within our, our remit. And then there's obviously different departments within that. We were only set up in July last year, so it's okay. still growing. I think we're around about 17, 20 people right now, but it's, 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 it's growing. The president doubled our budget, which was already a good start. Lovely. We could do with more. <laughs> uh, we could always do with more to be able to, to increase the testing. But it's um, it's also just kind of changing the, the, the flow. So the only flow that comes from the IAAF, for example, is funding. Okay. They have no idea of ah, who's being so tested, what's been be done, who's been caught. None of that until it's released. So it's fully in, in, independent. We might have to investigate people within the IAAF, so it has to, to be independent that way. And it's kind of on the anti-doping side, looking at different ways. Um, so not just testing, 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 but also intelligence. Mm -hmm. What's coming? What products are coming in? Where where they're going? The entourage who's supplying and trying to trying to listen to the athletes a lot more and really make the athletes feel that yeah, if you un hear something or you learn something and it concerns you, just come and tell us. It doesn't mean it's going to be made public or right. we're going to necessarily go. On point to that person and say you're guilty but we're just going to investigate things and it, it's kind of opening those doors so that the information and the trust flows much better between athletes, coaches and federations and the integrity unit. That's awesome. Um, I say on this show all the time that I think that British track and field fans are, are the best that there are. Um, 
tell me about the state of the sport in Great Britain. You guys got a nice bump in 2012. Um, you guys hosted a fabulous World Championships in 2017. Tell me about the state of the sport in Great Britain now. I think it's doing okay. I think we could definitely do with, um, like we've talked about before, more grassroots. Just lost Mo Farah. Yeah. Well, at least well we haven't lost him. He's We're just moved to the, the marathon. Track, yeah. um, but we've also got really good, strong bunches coming through. Good depth. Um, eight, fifteen on the men's and women's side that we haven't right. had for a long time. The sprints are coming through. Dina's running, Dina's running amazing up. this year. So all of that depth, and they're young. Laura Muir. They're all kind of young. Beginning, beginning of their 20s, middle of yeah. their 20s. So it's it's for a while, and behind that, there there's good strength coming through. So I think, kind of on the elite side, it's good. I'd like to see a lot more youngsters just across the country, just saying, yeah, athletics is cool. That's what I want to do. I want to get involved in athletics because I feel like we're losing out on those coming into that sport. And yeah. So I'm pretty sure that this is going to air after the World Cup has already been decided. So tell me about your uh, <laughs> the emotions of watching your country for the first time in a long time in your lifetime um, doing this well in the World Cup. It's kind of exciting. Yeah, it is. It's really exciting. I mean, you have to. I live in in Monaco as <laughs> right? well, so I, I have a lot of French friends. I have a lot of Croatian friends. So what happens if France plays England in the final? What where where are your loyalties uh, going to lie there? A lot of people. My kids are bilingual, and they, yeah. uh, they've been asked a lot of times, "Well, who who do you cheer for?" And my husband is is Irish, so <laughs> he's like, uh, England, well, I don't know. Maybe I prefer France. <laughs> no, he's not. Uh, so I think at the minute they they are going England, um, but yeah, it's that. Kind Kind of mm. enjoyment I think yeah. it's, it's just good to, to see them playing well there's a lot of pressure on every year um, yeah. and there's a lot of there's a lot of fans who are, think they're out there on the pitch playing with the team when they're winning and when they're losing they're oh no that's just them that's not us yes. um, and I think that that mentality is it's good to see the guys coping with the pressure and going out and delivering and I think Gareth Southgate's doing a brilliant job. <laughs> Let's talk about the kids that you mentioned. Um, they're bilingual because they have they have grown up for the most part um, in Monte Carlo. Tell me about their athletic aspirations though. How much is mom and dad going to push them? Are they expected to play a sport? Are they expected to run middle distances? What what is the family outlook on your kids? I think we definitely try not to, to push them, but they are kind of expected to, to be active, to be physically active. I think the yeah. importance that I've seen, uh, I do a lot of work after I work with the World Health Organization, just basically ending childhood obesity and trying to do what we can to get kids today fitter. So that they do a sport is kind of expected of my kids. I mean, it's yes. not hard to be honest. They're always <laughs> running around doing something. But which sport they choose and to what level they take it, I think has to be entirely up to them. They want, I want them to find that area that may not even be sport, but that area in their life, which lights that passion that we had, that makes you want to go out and work hard and give it 100% and stick at it through those, those tough training days, through those injury times. If you don't have that, I don't think you can force someone to, to find that it has to be it has to be within them. They have to discover that area. So it's, it's just supporting them to to find that if they can. I mean, they have grown up around athletics. They they've kind of without knowing. My daughter's played with Haile's kids in <laughs> in Ethiopia. They've been on training camps. Right, they kind right, of grew of up in the sand pit at the track when we were down there training. So yeah. they they get to to kind of appreciate I guess the the good things in athletics um, and in other sports as well. I was having a conversation a couple of years ago with um, tennis legend Boris Becker and he talked about how hard it was to transition from being as good as he was just out of the sport and now he's a successful businessman and so on. He said the athlete part of you has to die and I've never forgotten it. Um, I know that you sort of struggled with the end. I, I want to go on, but my body's betraying yeah. me and I want to go on. Tell me about your transition from pro athlete to retired athlete and what that was like for you. I think now with hindsight looking back, I think I handled it way more, way better than I thought I was going yeah. to. I, I always knew that for me, 
I was never going to choose to to give up competing. To choose to <laughs> kicking to and screaming. I huh? love the training yeah. environment. I love the competing environment. So if I could have gone on, if my body would have allowed me, I would still be out there trying to compete now. Um, so I knew, kind of knew that was going to get forced on me. Um, and when my body started to to give out, that's when it's not fun. When you're kind of trying to get to the target and you're getting injured, that's you're not being able to do it. Yep. And then finally, with a foot injury in 2012, and they said, well, we don't even know if you're going to be able to run again then it kind of really becomes serious. So then when I worked for nine months before I was even to get able to get back to like a minute of jogging, wow. um, I appreciated that so much that I didn't want to push that and I didn't want to sort of kill that off in trying to get back to, to compete when my body wasn't as efficient as it was before anyway. Um, and so I think that kind of helped that time out completely from running meant that I appreciated what I was able to do. And at the same time, I'd been able to kind of transfer that drive that we have when we're competing and when we're training into different areas so into being a mom into commentating which was a whole new skill set i had to to <laughs> learn from scratch um, into trying to be able to give back in other areas like with the integrity unit and still being able to to stay in contact with the sport so i think all of those things i think actually as a distance runner i'm probably pretty lucky because i can still i went out for a run this morning i can still get oh, wow. out um, and run every day for pleasure but i, I don't start my watch i don't clock how many wow, miles i'm doing it's just my time to Lovely. to enjoy and to get to do that that i didn't before which is sometimes for a social run it doesn't matter that it's way slower than i would normally be running i'm just <laughs> chatting to a friend and i'm enjoying it or i'm taking the kids for a run well, anybody you run against you're gonna have to slow down <laughs> i have to do the talking usually yeah They're like you keep talking and we'll just keep running you mentioned commentating and uh, i marvel all the time that my entire generation of athletes dominate the airwaves now and certainly <laughs> in great britain so yourself denise lewis michael johnson Catherine jonathan Mary. edwards Catherine mary I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of funny to see all of us now, um, you know, retired and, you know, having to, 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 to broadcast. Tell me about what your favorite thing is about broadcasting. Oh, I think my favorite thing is the privilege of, of, of having that number one seat in the house right on the finish line. <laughs> that we get doesn't hurt. All of the races. Um, and you don't, you do sometimes have the nerves, obviously, for people yeah. that you know out competing, but you don't have the same nerves that we had. And you can really in, enjoy the show. And I think also it kind of, on some level, replicates a little bit that adrenaline shock because you've got to get it right. You've got to try and call it right. We, of course, right. we make mistakes. We're learning all the time yeah. um, but that I really enjoy the camaraderie too I think it's a really nice team like yeah. everyone that you've just named I've learned such a lot from, from Steve Cram and being able to sit alongside right. him and kind of pick up what I can and learn Steve what I can. Steve is really awesome. <laughs> and that, that team aspect it's kind of it's not the same as being out there on the track, but it's similar and you understand also what the athletes are going through. Well, you and I have been friends for a very long time. I'm so glad that we got a chance to finally have you on the show. I wish you Thank all the you. best with the Athletics Integrity Unit. Thank you very much. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you.